Hey, what's up, guys? Thanks for coming back. I got a great show in store for you today. I'm bringing someone on that I've been following for over a year. And this individual that we're going to be introducing you to, well, my partner got to meet him firsthand at this wholesaling mastermind summit. He came back. And he told me, he said, hey, Clint, I got to meet Pace. And not only did I meet Pace, understand this. We buy properties from him. I mean, it was such a small world to know because as you hear me talk about all the properties that I've been acquiring and I acquire in different areas of the country, you know that I don't do it on my own, that I work through individuals like Pace who find the deals and then they bring me these awesome deals. And I thought, what better person to bring on to share with all of you an exceptional speaker, someone who's going out there, he's killing it in real estate. He's got his own show coming out on a &E. It's going to be in September. He's got a site called sub2.com. He knows how to kill it when it comes to real estate investing. Pace, what's going on? Clint Coons. I'd say one of my biggest heroes. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you tremendously. Um, you know. Great. I was I was lucky to meet Toby. I was so lucky to meet Toby. I had no idea Toby was going to be at that mastermind, by the way. I, It's a mastermind that we're not even allowed to talk about what the name is. It's like this secret exclusive. They call it the super group. I'm allowed to at least say the name now because it's been slipped. But it's invite only. It's like the black card of wholesale masterminds. And so very, very high level people. We fly out there. You don't even know who's in the room until you get there and you go, oh my gosh, that guy. Oh my gosh, that guy. Oh my gosh, that guy. And I saw Toby, your partner, and I was like, I was actually looking around for you. I'm like, don't tell me Anderson is here. Like, don't <laughs> tell me Anderson is in this mastermind. And it turns out Toby was actually speaking. And I was blown away and so was the rest of the room. And it was so amazing how well Toby spoke about your guys' business, your partnership, and what you guys have essentially done over the last you know, years and years of being in this business, not just what you do for your core business, but also what you guys for do for real estate investing. And I'm like, this is who I've always wanted as my business advisor, right? Somebody who does my, helps out with my accounting, my bookkeeping, my strategy, my tax consult, like everything, everything, because you guys understand real estate investing. But I got no joke, a million dollar, maybe a hundred million dollar education in a nine hour stint because the entire room loved what he was saying so much that the other six speakers said, I can't follow this. It's so good. Toby, keep going. And the topic that we spoke about was about charities. Mm -hmm. We spoke about charities, donating properties to your charities, essentially building tax free wealth. Um, or tax th uh, free cash flow inside those charities and IULs and all of the heavy duty stuff that you would imagine happens behind closed doors at a high level mastermind. And man alive, I just, I was so blown away. There's very few um, CPAs, attorneys, et cetera, that are real estate investing at any level, let alone the level you guys are doing where you have hundreds of doors. And I was just so excited to be entered into your world. And now here I am on your show and I'm very, very grateful. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you're here because, you know, people that follow my channel, you know, I'm always talking about how to protect real estate and different strategies to reduce taxes. But it's not very often that I bring on someone like you who's out there acquiring the real estate. And I know that that's the other side of it, right? You can't set up, I mean, there's no reason to have all these LLCs and land trusts if you don't even know how to get started. And so, you know, you teach many different strategies, you, you know, creative financing is one of your big ones, um, buying property subject to wholesaling. And we don't have a ton of time, but what I would like to do is just dive into one of those, one of those strategies, a key strategy. And let's take everyone from start to finish, because real estate is such a tremendous opportunity for people to build not only cash flow, but to build generational wealth. Right. I mean, that's why we do it. And then from there, you can do more, not only for your family, but you can do more for others as well by having that availability and that freedom from there. You know, it's, so it's, it's interesting, Clint, if you think about your life and my life, neither one of us wake up in the morning and worry about how we're going to pay the bills, right? Mm -hmm. And so essentially, you're still working and I'm still working, but I would say I'm retired and I would also say you're retired. That's correct. You don't wake up in the morning and have to do anything. And so ultimately, I imagine your audience is tuning in to say, how do I go and work on my life's biggest purpose? Whether it's running Anderson Business Advisors, whether it's running you know, sub2.com, whatever it is, how can I change the world through my own individual niche? Well, 
it starts by quitting your job. It start it starts by not being tethered to the financial strains of waking up every morning and saying, how am I going to pay my bills? Right. And so I imagine most of the people that you and I speak to or the audience on YouTube or the audience of your podcast, I would say 5,000, maybe $10,000 a month in residual income would be a life changing amount of money that they could truly quit their job and truly spend more time either A, with their family or B, more time amplifying their wealth. And we all know if you're at a nine to five job, you're not, ampl you're not amplifying your wealth and people feel that. They feel that burden, that ball and chain on them. So guys, uh, Clint is inviting me. So thank you so much. He's inviting me to share with you one strategy that I love. And I'm going to share this one with you because it can be done no matter your experience level. And you don't need to be licensed to do it. You don't need to have a ton of money to do it. And you can do one deal, truly one deal, and quit your job off of one deal. So I've got some really fun ones, but I'm going to go through a seller finance deal. Okay. And what I like about this deal specifically is I like that I didn't have to go find the lead. The lead was brought to me by somebody else, very similar to you, Clint. You guys buy your deals from wholesalers and other real estate investors that might either A, just go, hey, this one doesn't fit our criteria, but this is in, you guys are in like North Carolina. Where are you guys investing primarily? Right yeah, Winston-Salem now. We have Houston, Oklahoma City. Those are our two big markets, but Winston-Salem has eclipsed it. Right. So if an investor comes along a deal in those areas and they go, I don't want to hold that or I don't want to fix and flip it, that is where they would come to you guys and say, would you guys take this off my hand? So this is what happened to me, right? I um, had somebody that knew I was in the market in Dallas. I wanted to buy an investment property in Dallas. And I just sent a message out on a couple of Facebook posts in a Dallas investor Facebook group. So guys, it's very simple. Take notes. Step one, go into a Dallas investor Facebook group. There's probably 40 or 50 of them. Some of them are wholesale centric. Some of them are buy and hold centric. It doesn't matter which one you go in. You can just say, Hey, I'm looking for a seller finance opportunity in the Dallas market. And that's what I did. Why did I choose seller finance? Cause I hate getting loans. I really, really hate getting loans. I don't want to pull. I haven't pulled my credit on the last 700 homes we've acquired. I haven't pulled my credit. Haven't looked at my bank account. Nobody's looked at my bank account, no title company, no escrow officer, nobody has looked at my bank account, my tax returns. Can you imagine that? Buying all these homes without somebody even asking for a tax return, let, or, let alone even asking if you have them, it's bonkers. So step one, I made a post in a Facebook group and I said, hey, I'm looking for an Airbnb. I want to buy a property in, in the Dallas area and ultimately turn into an Airbnb. And my post was this, this is what I said. Does anybody have a seller finance opportunity, I will pay whatever the seller wants. Sounds crazy. Sounds absolutely crazy. And I want to kind of walk you through this because most people think that the best way to buy real estate is to buy at 60, 70 cents on the dollar. And we do that. We do a lot of that. But this one, I ended up paying a little bit over retail for this, but I want to show you how you can edge out your competition by utilizing seller finance and you can be one of the very few people going after some of these opportunities. And this one house that I'm going to go through, one house, and I'm going to do it in less than seven minutes, nets me, nets $10,800 a month, every single month on app. There's some months I make 14 grand. There's some months I make nine grand, but the average amount of money I make is 10, over $10,000 per month. So okay, hey, hold on one second. Yeah, yeah. Now we were talking about this before we we got started here. When I was on your show, we, you know, we're at a higher. Sometimes I went to a higher level. Yes. Subject to okay, seller financing. What you're talking about? There may be people watching that do not know what that term is. For sure. Yeah. So maybe you can explain what you're looking for when you say seller finance. Thank you so much. I appreciate you stopping me. That's great. I so here's the thing. If I am going to go buy a property, most people, if you go to like bigger pockets or you go to somebody, you essentially want to acquire these properties, right? Let's say that most people are looking for a 300 to a $400 net return and they want to go and look for investment opportunities through real estate, right? Let's say I'm a nurse or I'm a doctor, I'm a 
I'm an attorney and I need to put some excess cash into real estate so I can start making some net returns in my pocket. Most people go out and get a loan. That's pretty cool, except it takes forever and it is horrible and you get limited on what you can borrow and all that kind of stuff. And ultimately when you go borrow money to buy investment properties, you end up paying a little bit higher interest rate with commercial um, loans. And even though the interest rates right now are like 2.8 to 3.2%, most investors are not getting that for an investment property. They're usually getting between three and a half to six and a half percent. Okay, that's going through the bank. So if you're going through the bank and you're getting your loans at three and a half to six and a half percent, you also are typically putting anywhere between 20 to 35% down to acquire these loans. Okay, so let's say that I'm Mr. I'm a doctor and I've got an extra $100,000 that I need to go and invest. Hell, let's make it way smaller than that. Who has an extra $100,000 laying around? Let's make it $25,000. Let's say I have $25,000 to invest. What most people's strategy is, is they go to a bank and they say, how much can I qualify for? I want to go out and start buying investment properties. The bank then says, well, you know, with your income and what other things you have going on, we can get you qualified for $400,000. Okay, cool. So this is the traditional method, guys. The traditional method is now this doctor goes to a real estate agent, doctor goes to an agent, and the agent then goes to the MLS or the multiple listing service where you buy basically retail properties. You pay full price. The retail agent then brings that opportunity to the doctor and says, hey, doctor, I found a $400,000 house that you can qualify for and you know what? You're not going to make a ton of money on it, but it is a good investment and it's a good thing long-term. Takes them two to three months to get the loan. And ultimately, they now own a property. And the bank gives them, typically if they get qualified for a $400,000 purchase, they end up having to put close to $100,000 down. So if you were looking to only invest twenty five dollars well, you're going to be sorely surprised that the bank is going to ask you for about 20 to 35% as a down payment to secure the property in the event that you pass away or you default or something bad happens. So in this situ situation, who's, the, who's financing you is the bank. The bank is financing you, right? You go get qualified. You go through the, all that rigmarole. What I'm talking about is I just go directly to a house and I speak directly to the seller. And I ask the seller to become my bank and I bypass the agent and I bypass the bank. I no longer need the, an agent and I no longer need the bank. So I cross them out and I just work directly with the seller. And that's what I did here. So we went to the seller and the seller says, you know what? Uh, the purchase price on this, let's pull this up just real quick. Let me just make sure I have my purchase price correctly because I want to give you guys the address. And if I give you the address and start telling you numbers, and then we pull it up online and I don't actually have the right um, purchase price, somebody's going to grill me. So give me just a second. Are you the one that came up with the word hut up or shut up? I am that. I am that yeah. guy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for those of you, you know, what that means is there's a lot of people out there that talk about investing in real estate and that they're buying all these properties. And I've done the same thing as Pace will say to people, show me your huts, okay? Right. Whenever you want to go into joint venture, somebody wants to do business with you and they tell you they have experience, they show me the huts in your last five deals. First, oh, man, you got to ask that, them how many deals they've done. And if they that say would they stress done, somebody out. Yeah. A lot of people would be like, five deals? What, mm -hmm. Man, what are you talking about, five deals? Yeah, but you always got to ask them first how many they did. So now that they have that number out there, then you can ask them for the huts, you know, so... That's how you can trap them. You see if they're real or not. Um, with yeah, and you can go, you can look all this, these addresses up. So if I go on my YouTube, which I, I do frequently, I have a show or a series called The Real Deal. Because when I was um, learning subject two and seller finance, which is essentially the process of having the seller finance you instead of going through the bank, I was reading a book and I also went to a mentor who charged me 25 
thousand dollars. And as I went through that, I learned that that person teaching me for the $25,000 had never actually bought a seller finance or subject to deal in his entire life. He learned it from a book, learned how to become a teacher and was sitting there just scamming people. And, um, it wasn't until somebody asked him, Hey, do you have a settlement statement of one of these deals? I want to see how they're broken down that he then was like, well, you know, I've never done a deal, but I have partners who have, and it was this whole thing. And I said, you know what, man, either you have a HUD or you don't. And, um, he didn't. And so we essentially just decided we've got to go figure this out on our own or find people. And so now at this point, if somebody's not doing it themselves, I simply just don't want to learn from them. Period. That's all it comes down to. Exactly. So I've got a, I've got the address here. Let's pull this up just real quick. I've got the address and I'm going to pull the HUD as well. The address is property. So you guys can kind of follow along. Um, and I'll tell you the story. Why would a seller, cause a lot of people ask this, this question, why would a seller be your bank? Why wouldn't they just sell it on the open market? And this is why I love being on Clint's show because Clint's going to give you guys some understandings of why would a seller sell to you on seller finance, right? A lot of it has to do with capital gains. A lot of it has to do with maybe their, their financial situation, whatever, but let's jump into, um, at least giving you as a visual what this house looks like. So 9618 Waterview Parkway, 9618 Waterview Parkway. In Dallas, right? In Dallas, Texas. Yeah. And I'll pull this up so you guys can see it. I'll show you guys what, what day I bought it. So check it out. Let me see and make sure I got this popped up. All right. So as you can see, four bed, four bath, 4,200 square feet. It looks like off market. Interesting. His estimate's 563,900. And I want you guys to remember that. I'll write this down on the iPad. It's super important for you guys to understand this. His estimate history and detail. So let's look this up. Wow. That's so interesting that they don't have this on here. It was on here like two, three weeks ago. Hmm. Showing what day I closed on the deal. Yeah. Hold on just a sec. Home details. All right. Screw it. There's lots of sites too. I, don't, I mean, I don't, do you ever use data tree or use something similar to that? To let's that do, up? um, yeah, let's go back. This is fun stuff guys. Hold on just a second. So look at this home. It's crazy that you can buy a house like this. I never got, it doesn't look like this. This is when he originally bought it. And I'll show you guys the Airbnb listing as well. Let's see. Um, I ended up buying this house. This is the funny thing about it. I bought it. I want to show you instead of telling you. I ended up buying this house for $500,000. Okay. So I, we went to the seller. Seller says, I want $500,000. Now, why would a seller not just sell this to a real estate agent? Why would he sell the property to me for 500? And why would he allow me to, this is what seller finance is going back to Clint's previous question. The seller then says, you know what? I don't want all 500,000 up front. I am willing to take payments every single month. And I'm in, I'm, I'll give you a loan. So the seller and I create a note between the two of us or a promissory note. I also call it a fancy IOU. And the seller says, you owe me $500,000 and I want 50 grand down. Sounds like a lot, but I'll get to the, the story and how I work that down to $10,000 down. So the seller and I started communicating with each other. This was a referral from a wholesaler, right? So wholesaler, contacts the seller. The seller tells the wholesaler, I want 500,000. And at the time, about a year ago, we all know the market's gone up. This house on Zillow, Zillow had the, the Zestimate at about $475,000. So anybody paying attention to this right now, if you're a wholesaler or if you're somebody, let's say you're a real estate agent or you're a real estate investor, 
When you see a house that's worth $475,000, you don't want to buy that for four seventy-five. dollars You want to buy that for three fifty, dollars right? Wholesalers want to buy that for three twenty-five. dollars So when you hear that I actually paid $500,000 for a $475,000 house, people are blown away. Okay, they're blown away, but watch what this all looks like. So I communicate with the seller and I said, look, I would buy this for 500,000. It looks like the wholesaler who brought you and I together, there's no way he's paying 500, let alone 475, let alone 400. So if I'm, this is the line we say to sellers. So write this down, guys. If I'm willing, if I was willing to give you the price you want, would you be willing to give me the terms that I need? That's the line, it's very simple. If I'm willing to give you the price that you want, would you be willing to give me the terms that you need? And that stops the seller in their tracks and they go, what do you mean by terms? Well, seller, I'd be willing to give you your 500 grand. I mean, it's over market as it is now, but the only way I would make my money is if I was able to give you as little amount of money down as a down payment and you become my bank and take payments over the next 30 years. This seller says, you know what? That would actually help out my tax situation instead of me selling this on the open market. So Clint, let's say I'm a, cli I'm a client of yours and I sell my house for 475 on the open market. One, I'm not receiving 475,000 on the open market because I've got to pay real estate agents and commissions and all that kind of stuff. But let's say I, have, I get a chunk of money of 425 grand and I originally bought that house for 325 10 years earlier. I have a $100,000 gain on that property, right? So would I be paying taxes on that $100,000 right out of the gate? How does that typically work? Well, what you do on that deal, if that was his personal residence, how you can mm -hmm. make it even sweeter for this individual, you would say, listen, I want to capture 121 capital gain exclusion, which allows you to sell your personal residence that you've lived in for two out of the past five years and exclude mm -hmm. up to $250,000. So if you're married, that's 500K. Now here's what happens when you take that installment sale. So, so they may go to their CPA and the CPA will tell them, well, if you do this and you, you follow pace well, the way he wants to pay you, you're gonna be paying tax on all of that capital gains because you're not taking it all in year one, you're spreading it out over 30 years. So they'll tell them from a tax standpoint, it doesn't make sense to do this. Here's what you tell them. You say you can opt out of the installment sale treatment in year one and treat all of that gain as being recognized in year one, which it won't be taxable to you because you can exclude up to 250. Therefore, as you receive those payments in the future, they're completely tax-free. So your CPA, although he's correct, he doesn't understand the right strategy to make sure you'll get a payment stream that you won't have to pay taxes on. We well, have to pay taxes on the interest, but you won't pay taxes on all the capital gains by just saying, oh, I'll treat it all as taxable in year one, but because it's a house, it's non-taxable to me, it's a wash, now all the future payments tax-free. And this is exactly what he did. He went down the road of saying a, a, an installment sale actually is better for me. And what did he say? What did you say? It's called opting out of what? You opt out of installment sale treatment. So when you sell the house, so, mm -hmm. so I do this, I, I got a video on this where I talk about people that want to turn their personal residence into a rental. And I, I outline a strategy where you set up a corporation, you sell your, your personal residence to the corporation, and then you do it on an installment sale, just like you're saying here, but then you opt out of installment sale treatment to treat all of that income that you haven't received in year one as being taxable. But since it's your personal residence, it's non-taxable to you. So then as you pay yourself back over the next 30 years, all those principal payments that are coming back to you that would have been part gain, part return of basis, it's all tax-free. The only I thing you're that. going to be taxed on is the interest. And you're writing the interest off as well. So it's a, it's a great technique. And what you just did there, if that guy opted out of installment sale treatment, he's going to be even loving this even more because now he's getting that money back over time, which he needed and what she wanted, and he's not paying tax on it, except for the interest portion. So we ended up working at a deal where I only gave him $10,000 down. Mm -hmm. And he ended up giving me 3% interest on the deal. Wow. Yeah, crazy, crazy good deal. And so essentially 
why was he selling? Well, he was selling. There's always a reason, right? Everybody wants to know why. Brand new investors want to know why. Well, when we're wholesaling and we're trying to find people in distress, wholesalers look for one thing, okay? We look for this magic word called pain. And as much as I don't want sellers to have pain, the sellers who sell at a discount typically do have some sort of pain. And a, a portion of that pain would be, I inherited the property through uh, you know, probate, I, my parents passed away, I now have a house that I can't afford, there's property taxes and insurance and upkeep I can't take care of and I just need to get rid of this thing and I don't, have, I don't even have the money to fix it up. That's one, this is what we found is there's about 50 profiles of sailors inside of a wholesale, a wholesale world. And it's, I got a divorce, I lost my job, half my house burned down, um, my, I found out my tenants are cooking meth in my, my you know, my, whatever it is. There's 50 profiles that we run into over and over and over. And because we solve their pain with a quick sale, we can buy properties anywhere between 60 to 75 cents on the dollar. So um, not percent, 60 to 75 cents on the dollar. And that's where we make our spread, right? What happens when you have a seller that doesn't have pain? Somebody like me using creative finance, I'm not looking for pain, I'm looking for gain to give to that seller, okay? It's either gonna be pain or gain. So this seller in a seller finance situation, what did he really want? He wanted a high price. He wanted to feel like he didn't leave anything on the table. He also wanted an investment to continue to pay him, right? These are smart, savvy people. And then he also, as Clint talked about, he wanted tax benefits. So there's three reasons why this investor or this homeowner decided to sell on seller finance and not take a big lump sum right out of his pocket if he sold it on the open market for $475,000. He would have had to take, I don't know, probably $40,000 in commissions, closing costs, et cetera, right out of the gate. And he would have only walked away with $435,000. With me, I paid him $500,000 but not up front. I paid him 10 grand up front just to secure it. And then I put an agreement together that if I ever default, he gets the home back. Okay. And we did it. What we did is we did a deed in lieu of foreclosure and he has that sitting in his chest drawer. He can take that property right back. If I ever default, it's in our note, it's in our deed of trust. It's in all of that stuff. He can take that property back. It's kind of a magical agreement that we drafted up. So I owe him still $490,000. And my agreement with him is over the next 30 years, I will then make a payment to him that is principal and interest. And I then go out and I pay the taxes and I pay the insurance on my own, okay? So my total income on this property, we ended up converting this into an Airbnb. This, the total income on this property is a little over $20,000 a month. This is one of five properties I own that brings in $20,000 a month. Okay, so this property bringing in $20,000 a month, my total cost of my management fee, I have a gentleman that charges me 15%. My management fee is $3,000 per month. Somebody else manages it. And what does that mean? That means the HOA is in their name, utilities are in their name, the Airbnb account is in their name, all the maintenance re repair, uh, repair requests, the, the cleaners, everything is in their name. Somebody else manages this property for me. Okay, I've never been to the property. I've never seen it. I've never had to order furniture. I've never had to do any of that stuff. My manager did all of that right up front. So I, there's a $3,000 management fee. My PITI, right? Principal interest taxes and insurance to the seller is about $4,200 per month. And then we have a um, miscellaneous amount, which is repairs, utilities, um, you know, HOA expenses, all of those types of things. We have another $2,000 a month on average is what that is. And after $20,000, we end up netting. Yeah, this one actually worked out almost exactly to where our average is, $10,800 per month. I've never been to the house. I didn't have to qualify for the house. I don't know if I'll ever go to this house, which is perfectly fine by me. But here's what's kind of cool. 
is there were people are like, you paid 500 grand for a property that a wholesaler would have had to have bought for, I don't know, really, truly, probably $325,000. So wholesalers think that I overpaid for the property, but what was I really going for here? And guys, what I'll do for with Clint is I actually have the recording of the call that I made with the seller where the seller says, hey, I really don't need to sell this property, but if somebody gave me 500 grand, I would consider it. I talked to the seller for 45 minutes. I recorded the entire call with the seller's permission. And I have the call where I negotiated the seller to $10,000 down with a 3% interest rate for 30 years. And I'll give that to Clint so he can give you guys a link to that. So you guys can go through, listen to it and see how these conversations roll. But what's amazing is people think I overpaid for this property, but I really didn't. What I was looking for is I'm looking for yield. I'm looking for what is my cash on cash return. And my cash on cash return for this property was $10,000 down is what I invested, plus $5,000 in closing costs and miscellaneous. And then I paid my Airbnb gentleman $15,000 to furnish the property and get it set up. We buy secondhand furniture, by the way, guys. It's like, you know, estate sales and all that kind of stuff. So we're into this property, $30,000 was my total investment, okay? And if I have a $10,800 return net every single month, my yield on this property, and Clint, tell me if I'm wrong on yield, but essentially my yield is my cash on cash return. I'm looking at, let's pull this up. If I'm bringing in an average of $10,800 per month, and I multiply that by 12 months, that's 129,000 percent, 129,600. I would then, let's see what my yield is. So I'd take $30,000 and I would divide that by $129,600. And that should give me my percentage. That's a 200, oh my gosh, 231% return. Well, your cash in this deal, if that was 10K. Well, my cash to the seller was 10K, right? Mm -hmm. So the seller got $10,000. And you're pulling in $129,000 a year off a 10K investment. Right. Now I've got some other ones that are not as good, right? I have one in Atlanta that I could pull up for you guys, a 78 Maddox that I gave the seller way more money. It was a $1.2 million purchase. I gave the seller $110,000. But that's not a good example for somebody who's like, can I do this myself? Can my first deal help me get retired? That's not a good first deal because you guys would have to go figure out how to get a hundred and something thousand dollars. This one's a good one because the seller only took $10,000 down. I paid for the escrow and closing costs of five grand. And then my Airbnb setup was $15,000. My total investment was $30,000 into this deal. And my 129 that I bring in net is a 231% return every single year. Now, the best part about this, yes, it is the return. It is definitely the return is the best part. But the second best part of this is what would I, what would you do, Clint, if you had just purchased a $500,000 property and you put an additional $20,000 between Airbnb setup and closing costs into it. So your total cost of this property was $520,000. Would you go after the depreciation on this? So here's what I would do. And I'm going to cut a video on this, guys. You're going to want to come back and watch it. It'll, it'll cut, hit next week after, after you've seen this video. With Airbnb, you have a unique opportunity. Now, what Pace said is he had someone professionally manage it. I would step in and I would run this property for the first year myself. And I would put in 100 hours overall into my investment, which is easy, I can calculate. So with Airbnb, there's a unique way of taking what you put into the property. So you saw that he put in, you, you know, um, how much did you put into the repairs? 30 grand total. 30 grand, furniture, all of that. It becomes immediately deductible to your W-2, plus you take a cost setting, which is you accelerate the depreciation mm. on the property. Maybe that's going to pick them up another $35,000, $40,000, so you could potentially write off against your income. This is great for physicians, and I'll detail all this in the video. Be sure to watch it next week. 70 k so that's a $70,000 deduction. You're not limited by uh, how much income you make. You don't have to be a real estate professional. All you have to do is material participate and run this deal yourself for a short period of time. And then after you 
suck up all the deductions, then throw it over to a professional manager. Interesting. So, yeah. So depending on how you're doing, so, I mean, Airbnb is a great, it's a secret uh, tax break for people that do not know about this. And many times they, they, they make the mistake, you know, if they're not at your level where you're a real estate professional, you're writing everything off. But if they're not there, they're not thinking that they can deduct all of these expenses. And there's a way, there's a way to do it if you do it right. And you guys watch my video and I'll show you how. That's super interesting. So for somebody that let's say gets their first deal, right? So guys, what we can do another video all about this later of like how uh, maybe a little bit more in depth of where the money came from and what the settlement statement looks like and all that kind of stuff. But if I'm first just jumping into the business and I want to do an Airbnb and have somebody else manage it for me because I don't know what I'm doing, your suggestion is still go manage it, go learn how to manage it so that you can take a larger deduction in your first year. I, can that be held against my or taken against my W-2 income if I'm That's a W-2? Key. Absolutely it can. So if your spouse is working, you can take it against her income. A lot of the, uh, you brought up a physician. I mean, this is a secret for physicians that they need to take advantage of if they're investing in real estate. Turn it into that Airbnb, run it. Maybe your spouse runs it for a bit, but as long as you hit 100 hours, the material participation test, you're golden. And then next year, do whatever you want with it. But that first year, that's the best year for these types of properties. So guys, what I'll do for you is if, if you guys want us to come back and do something together, I'll give you a step-by-step -step and we'll actually go to like, maybe I'll show you guys how to post in like a Dallas real estate investor Facebook group. I'll do a screen share. We'll go in and show you guys how to get people sending you opportunities like this. Essentially, somebody brought this opportunity to me and said, this seller really wants to sell. They're buying a brand new home in Houston and they're moving but they're married to a specific number. There's these opportunities everywhere. We have houses in Atlanta, Florida, uh, Dallas. We've stayed away from Houston because it's very humid for us, but we have so many opportunities in Houston, tons in Phoenix, a lot in Vegas, and um, we're opening up in a couple of other um, vacation towns. These opportunities just come to us. The only place we actually spend money on, our, on marketing is in our backyard of Arizona. Everywhere else, all my other deals come from referrals. I don't have to cold call a seller. I don't have to text a seller. These come to me through Facebook groups. It's very, very simple. So if you guys want us to come back, make a comment down in the video down below and say, hey, do part two where you guys show us how to go get these opportunities to come to us. And then you go to a Anderson Business Advisor and actually ask them how to, because I don't think anybody's going to have enough information. So either A, watch the video that Clint has coming out or B, you actually consult with somebody on your team at your guys' office and say, how do I actually do this? What paperwork do I need to follow along to actually have that exclusion and take this against my W-2 income? Because, oh my gosh, people with W-2 wages are getting taken to town on their taxes. It is crazy what is happening. I know. And what's great about what you just showed everyone I always talk about putting properties into LLCs. And when you're using Freddie Fannie, conventional financing, underwriting guidelines, we've talked about this multiple times in my videos. You can't close in an LLC. But with seller financing, you can. Because he doesn't care. He's secured against the property. The seller doesn't care if you're taking in a corporation, a trust, a limited partnership. It's not relevant to them. So this is a great strategy. So you close directly in the LLC. It doesn't relate back to you. And, you know, one other thing is that if you're sitting here listening to Pace talk about these numbers and you're thinking, who would sell or take 3% on, the, on, a, on a deal like this? All kinds of people. And this is a great opportunity now for the, this type of strategy. And I'll tell you why. Because where else are you going to put your money? Just the other, about two weeks ago, um, we had an institution uh, investment group come to us and approach us on one of our properties. It's a, it's a multifamily property. And they were willing to buy it at about a six cap. And we bought it at about 15 to 17. So we could make, I don't know, a couple million bucks by flipping this deal to them. And we've only owned it for a short period of time. But the thing is, is that if I flip it to them and let's say I get paid a million and a half dollars profit, I make that in four months, people would say, well, that's awesome. But the problem I have is where am I going to deploy that and get that type of return? I can't move that money that quick and get the return I'm getting right now on my property. And people are out there. They know that. That's why if you give them three, like, oh, that's better than what I'm going to get in the savings account. 
That's this why is, this is, is such good information. If you don't mind me sharing just one last thing really, really quickly. I've got a property on 2720 North Sterling and we bought it 18 months ago. Okay. And hopefully Zillow is it's being weird. Oh, here we go. This one actually has the info on it. So we bought it for 372. Uh, you know, you can see it right here, November of 2019. So a year and a half ago. And we bought it subject to, which means the seller gave me essentially just said, here's my deed. I took over the deed and I took over payments. I didn't give the seller any money for this property. The seller didn't get anything for this. I took over their loan, right? And started paying their payment to Wells Fargo. The payment's like 1900 bucks a month. But this cute little house, we ended up turning this into an Airbnb. And in 18 months, it appreciated $200,000. It's so interesting to me. Um, it is just way better to have these types of investments than anything else. When you started telling me that story, Clint, about the, the hedge fund coming to you and saying, hey, we'll buy this multifamily from you and you guys can make a couple of million bucks. I was like, I bet you Clinton Toby wouldn't sell that. Like where else would you put your money besides real estate? Yep. And the sellers, here's the cool thing about the sellers. They aren't me and they aren't Clint. They don't want to be real estate investors, but they, re they still want their money tied to real estate so it's safe and they want that monthly return. So the seller got that. The seller got the purchase price he wanted of 500,000. And now his debt that I owe him, the debt that my debt that I owe him, 490,000 is secured against the property and he gets a 3% return on that. So even though he doesn't have any management, he doesn't have to deal with the stupid HOA anymore. He doesn't have to deal with any of that stuff. That guy's in the best position and he's making a passive return. Every seller wants that at that level. They're like, where else am I going to put my money? I don't know where else I can put my money. It's going to give me that secured thing. So anyway, it's so, so much fun. And it's one of these things where once you figure out that it's possible, you start seeing it everywhere. So if you guys want to learn more about this, let us know and we'll come back. We'll do a part two of this. It'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. And if you guys want us to do a part three on just wholesaling, because you have a, a tremendous program on how to put those deals together. I mean, you're who I've been buying through and I right. didn't even know it. Um, guys, throw you know, that in the show notes as well. So Clint, just real quick. One thing that we just did, because so many people are like, well, what's the step-by-step -step process? So mm -hmm. We, cre we did this challenge for ourselves. We went to our Facebook group. We have a Facebook group of like 28, 29,000 people. And we said, hey, if we were gonna start in a brand new market, no LLC, no logo, no website, no company name, no leads, nothing. And we were gonna start from scratch and live stream ourselves building a business from scratch, not educating you on how to do it, but literally doing it ourselves and letting you have a front row seat. What market, would you want us to do it in? So over the series of six weeks, we voted on Charlotte, North Carolina, not too far from where you guys invest. Mm -hmm. And we ended up starting a brand new business from scratch. We just finished this. It was a three week challenge. We only did it three hours a day just to show people that have a nine to five job or they have full time um, commitments that they can also do something like this in three hours a day. And in three hours, over three weeks, so 45 total hours, we bought five wholesale deals, two creative finance deals, and gener generated like $75,000 in net profit in a three-week time period. So we gave those recordings away to everybody at a website called zero to hero REI.com, zero to hero real estate investing.com, zero to hero REI.com. So if you guys want the recordings, take them. I'll put them in the show notes. I'll get them there too. Yeah, be happy yeah. to do that. And it, guys, there. I'm a monkey see, monkey do kind of guy. I have to watch somebody else do something in order for me to know how to do it. So if you want that type of level of education, let us know. Clint and I can do some more stuff together. That creative finance stuff, I think that has a lot of resonance with people because like you were just showing, talking about money, where do you come up with the money mm -hmm. to qualify for the properties? Well, when you learn creative financing, it opens up a whole new realm of opportunities for you. What, what I'll do is maybe what we do for part two is I'll show you this one really quick. This is a cool little note that we have um, where I bought this house and I had the seller actually seller finance my down payment to me. So I know it's hard for us to imagine this. We can deep dive on this another time, but check this out. I bought this property for a hundred grand. Okay. This is my note and my agreement with the seller. 
I bought it for $100,000. My down payment to the seller, which you can see their name, I've got permission to give out, and whether I have permission or not, this is public data. Perfect. Here's the seller, Dale and Susan Poyer, gave me their home for $100,000. My down payment was $10,000, but they let me make my payments over the course of 12 months. The seller paid my closing costs. So check this out. I got the house for free, right? Seller paid closing costs. Oops, my bad. Seller paid closing costs. And my monthly payment to them, you can see it right here on the note. This is what's so cool about this. $375,000 or $375 per month. And my interest rate, this is where, in, in, maybe we should have a conversation conversation about imputed interest. I would love to talk about that. Um, 0% seller financing. I got this house for 0% seller financing at $100,000. Okay. I would love to talk to Clint all about this, deep dive into this. The seller paid closing costs. My rent payment, my, I have renters in there, is $1,650 per month after I pay the seller $375 and I have another, you know, 200, I think it's like $275 a month in miscellaneous expenses like landscape and taxes and insurance. Our net on this property is $1,000 per month. So in one year, I made $12,000 net. And at the end of that year is when I paid my seller their down payment. You track that Clint? Yeah. So the seller let me make my down payment to them $5,000 every six months. So I'd make $6,000 net. I would turn around and give them five grand. I'd then do it again, make 6,000 net, give them five grand. This seller truly gave me a free house. I got the seller finance of the hundred grand. I got 0% interest. I got my down payment seller finance to me to the point where my tenant paid my down payment for me. That's the phone call I want to listen to. I have it. It's not a phone call. Yeah. That's a that's a physical appointment in this, the lady's house, me and her talking. And I said, what would you do? Because all the wholesalers were offering her 50, 60,000. I said, well, what number do you want? She goes, I want a hundred grand. And then guys, I gave the magic line. What's the magic line? Well, I'd be willing to give you a hundred grand if you'd be willing to give me the terms that I need. So after we got past what terms means, she goes, I would do it but I want $20,000 down and I want 8% interest. And that entire conversation of her saying that to the point where I got her to 0% seller, seller finance and she pays closing costs and I give her down payments over the course of a year, that entire conversation was recorded in her living room on my iPhone recording memos. So happy to give that to you guys. I would, I would love to share more and more stories like this. So when people say, can you really do real estate with no money out of your pocket? The answer is yes. That truly is a deal that cost me no money. I didn't pay closing costs. I inherited a tenant. So I didn't have to, re, I didn't have to renovate the property. The question everybody's going to ask is, why would a seller do that? Well, the reason being is because her and her husband were retiring. And they didn't want to deal with tenants. They didn't want to have to track the payments. They wanted to work with a reputable company and they were traveling the country in an RV. And they said, if we have to worry about another property while we're tra traveling the country in our RV, we'll lose our mind. And I said, great, I'll give you the number you want. So you win, but I need to return. I need to win in return. So this needs to be a win-win transaction. And we structured in a way where we both won. It's as simple as that. Yep. I mean, that's just great nuggets. It's all going to be in the show notes, guys. So click on that. And uh, if they want to follow you, how would they do that? What's the best way to, to reach out and get um, more information? Just go to just go to Instagram, guys. Like I, I have a course and all that kind of stuff, but I don't care whether you sign up for the course or not. What I care about is just follow me on Instagram, follow me on YouTube and tell me what you want to learn. I love teaching this just like Clint does. I, you get, if you guys have been following Clint for any amount of time, you know, he has a passion for teaching this stuff. I'm the same way. I get um, a helper's high from giving people information that took me 10 years to learn something that I can now sum up in five minutes, right? So that's all I care. Let me know what I can do to teach you guys and let me know if you guys want me to come back on Clint's show. Absolutely. I mean, you're going to be so busy after you become a star in A&E, we may not be able to get you back, but I'm glad I got you. Bro, first. I'm trying to get as many subscribers <laughs> on YouTube as you do. And, and hopefully I get there one day. Right on. 
Well, Bay, hey, thanks for sharing all that information. And uh, we're definitely going to get you back. We're going to go through this in more detail. Thank you, brother. I really appreciate you. All right, take care. 